You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Weeks. And I'm Jordan Pridgen. Yeah, joining me for a very special episode because today we are upgrading not one, but two of the precons from Murders at Karlov Manor. I said it right, I did it. Double precon upgrade. Double, double. Uh, yeah, today we are upgrading the deep. Clue C precon and the blame game precon. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to be comparing the two. Which one would we buy if it was sitting on the shelf? Which one do we like more? Uh, you know, doing a little comparison at the end. Uh, but before we get into any of that, we're going to be talking about a lot of magic cards today. We're going to be talking about some sealed product as well. You can get all of that at cardkingdom.com slash command. And if you do so, you are supporting the show when you do it. Your magic players, we know you're going to buy magic cards. You can get them from Card Kingdom and you can throw a little bit of extra support our way as well. Plus, Card Kingdom is a huge company. They have a great inventory of magic cards, so you know that you can get a ton of cards that you're looking for all in one place. You're not going to be hunting down individual cards through the USPS or various other mail systems. Crazy convenient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I love that when I am buying a deck, I know that a good chunk of the deck is all going to come from one place. It's going to show up professionally and it's going to show up in the condition that I ordered them in. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating to me than when I order a card that's, you know, that's near mint and it shows up and it's bent or it hasn't been packaged properly uh, or, or, or when you have to go through like 15 little envelope orders and you realize that three cards three cards are missing like, at some point yeah <sighs> uh, again you can use Card Kingdom they're the best over there we trust them for all of our magic card needs here at the command zone Car Card Kingdom dot com slash command and once those cards are in your hand you're going to need to protect them put them in sleeves put those in deck boxes wrap them all up in a play mat where are you going to find all those things Rachel ultrapro.com slash wow. command <laughs> Ultra Pro has the highest quality magic accessories in the business. Plus, the best thing about them is they have the officially licensed magic art. So all of the art that you know and love from your magic cards, you can go to Ultra Pro and see if they have it on products. I love having play mats that show off the art of the set that we're in. It makes you really feel like you've got the whole battlefield figured out. You know, when you've got your commander on your play mat and in the command zone and on your sleeves and on your deck box, you're like, whoa. Yeah, when you that sit down at a table like that, roll. it's a serious flex. <laughs> and if, like, why be a commander player if you're not flexing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> ABF, always be flexing. Always be flexing. I also love Ultra Pro products because I know that they're going to keep my cards safe. I really like the uh, satin cubes for my decks. They're nice and compact. They're really, really safe. And I know that when I fly with them, like when we go to MagicCon, they're going to stay safe in transit. Again, support the show and your Magic collection at ultrapro.com slash command. And the final way to support us is directly over at patreon.com slash command zone. All of our patrons get access to extra turns and game nights a day early and without ads. Plus, you get access to exclusive content like Turn Talk. Turn Talk is a really fun discussion that we have after every single game of Extra Turns, where we just talk about how the game went, how your deck played, what your favorite card in the episode was, um, sort of how you uh, your threat assessment What changed. might have happened with an extra turn? Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Uh, it's, it's a ton of fun, um, and it's absolutely worth it. Plus, you get to be a part of our Discord community and our Patreon community. Uh, again, Patreon dot com slash command zone plus we shout out one lucky patron every single podcast episode and this one is dedicated to matt, matt chu matt you rock you rock matt let's get into it we've got two pre-con upgrades to cover today and we are starting with the one that we got to um well i guess i wanted to talk about this before we before we get into the pre-cons we're upgrading two decks today we're changing right. nothing about how we do the upgrades it's still 10 yeah. cards out 10 cards in $50 budget, like right. we've been doing for the last um, couple of sets. Um, but we're going to be covering two in one episode. That means we're changing a little bit of how we cover these decks, what information that we give you. Um, again, if, you, if you're watching the episode and you find yourself missing something that we used to do or really loving something that we changed, let us know in the comments. We want to make sure that the content that we're making works for you guys. Um, so say what you think. Uh, we know that you will. Thanks. 
Awesome. Uh, yeah, let's get into it. We're going to upgrade the Deep Clue C Precon. Uh, this one is Bant. Yep. It's it's and it it's got a merfolk command. It does. Oh no, not merfolk. It doesn't. It looks <laughs> like a merfolk. It's an underwater Vidalcan fish detective. Okay. I'm so sorry, <laughs> Professor. This is not the Bant merfolk commander that you were after. Um, Reading the card definitely explains, explains the, card the card right there. Yeah, this is it's a Bant investigate uh, tokeny deck. So it's blue, white, green. <laughs> the deck has a little bit of investigative theme, a little bit of token theme and it also has like a draw two theme yeah like whenever you draw your second card something happens it has a number of those so that kind of goes along with the investigate theme um it's a little unfocused i would say there, there's like a little dash of this a little dash of that in the deck but uh the commander does kind of tie the room together a little bit so yeah let's meet the face commander morska morska undersea sleuth <laughs> <laughs> Green, white, blue for a 2 3 Vidalcan fish detective. Uh, she says, You have no maximum hand size at the beginning of your upkeep. Investigate. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, put two plus one plus one counters on Morshka. So, gives you a clue to give you that extra draw, right. gets a little bit of counters. And then I guess you just, you know, save up a lot of counters so you can, or save up a lot of clues so you mm. can start getting those second cards pretty consistently. And, Absolutely. Uh, and it also a... has ways to like double your draw. It mm -hmm. has, like, so when you sack a clue, you draw two cards and then it'll trigger it right away. Yeah. So it seems like it's just kind of Bant card advantage. Yes, that is. It's definitely like a Bant draw deck and it mm -hmm. has sort of some token other stuff. To get to know the deck a little bit more, we're going to go straight into the uh, best cards in the deck. Uh, starting with, uh, of course, if you're investigating, you, this card goes in the deck. It's Academy Manufactor. Oh, Academy Manufactor. Uh, this is three mana for a one three. And if you would create a clue, food, or treasure token, instead create one of each. I see this card in so many more decks these days. Like, it's become yeah. very, very good. I mean, if you're building a treasure deck, if you're building a clue deck, if you're building a food deck, it goes in. Yeah. It just does. And all of those are very, very popular themes. And Academy Manufacturer does exactly what you want to do in that kind of deck, which is just make more stuff. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think this is a card that will only keep getting better mm. because Wizards has been very clear that they like these themes and they, they really, keep printing really them do. in sets. <laughs> they keep doing more food, clues, and treasures and everything, so... Yeah, I, and this card really tells you that the deck is about having a lot of artifacts. Yep. Um, and that's that's part of of the actual strategy of the deck. And the next one, I think, also indicates that. It's Tezzeret, Betrayer of Flesh. This is two blue blue for a blue planeswalker. Uh, it says, the first activated ability of an artifact you activate each turn costs two less to activate. So the first clue that you sack every turn is free. Which is pretty nice. Really, really good. Makes clues much better, and clues are already pretty good. Then it has some abilities. We're really here for the static ability, but the first one is plus one, draw two cards, then discard two cards unless you discard an artifact. That is a minus two. Its target artifact becomes an artifact creature. If it isn't a vehicle, it has base power and toughness four, four. And minus six, you get an emblem with whenever an artifact you control becomes tapped, draw a card. I think really it's going to be here to make your clues free and then probably that looting ability. Yeah, well, and the super nice thing about it, which mm -hmm. is obvious but probably worth saying, is that even though you can only, like, tick him up or down on your turn, mm -hmm. you can crack a clue on each turn Yeah, because it's going to do it per turn. So yeah. that's just really going to make a whole pile of clues really good. Yeah, that just means that, like, even if you just have Morshka and Tezzeret, mm -hmm. now you can crack the clue that you got from Morshka for free. You could draw that second card, put two counters on it. Yeah. And then you only have to pay to crack one clue to trigger Morshka and, key and all of your other draw two. Yeah, strategies. it's kind of a whole plan right there. Right. So that says a lot to me, is that the intention of the deck is to make a ton of stuff, but also to actually crack these clues for cards. Uh-huh. Uh, and because Tezzeret is explicitly helping you to do that. But the... Next card is interesting because it does kind of go against that that idea. Yeah, but it's a fun card. It's excellent in this deck. This is Shimmer Dragon. Four blue blue for a creature dragon. It's a five six. It is flying. And as long as you control four or more artifacts, Shimmer Dragon has hexproof. That's already great. Mm -hmm. And then it can tap two untapped artifacts you control. Draw a card. That's great. 
Yeah, this means you do not have to crack those clues to draw cards anymore, and so you can keep them on board for some of your late game win cons, which rely on you having a ton of artifacts. Yep. Uh, Shimmer Dragon is is an all star in any of these decks. I'm really glad that it was reprinted here because it's perfect for this kind of strategy. And I mean, the way this card plays is it comes down, and often you already have so many artifacts on board mm-hmm. that you just like immediately draw four or five cards. Right. So I think these three cards are a really clear plan for the deck, especially yeah. looking at the commander. We're going to go into the most expensive cards, the best reprints in the deck, so you get a better overall picture of what you can expect from it. Uh, we're only going to talk about the cards that are worth $5 or more. There are 11 of these. That's pretty good. That's a huge amount of reprints, especially considering some of these prices. Uh, the first one is Benny Brax Zoologist, which is currently at $21. Benny draws you a card on your end step if you've made a token this turn. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, it automatically triggers your commander on uh, on end step without even cracking that clue, so you can save it for the next turn uh, and get some more of those draw two. Another great, synergies. I mean, this card needed a reprint because, again, yeah. they're just printing more and more token strategies, and this just continues to be great in all of them. Absolutely. Uh, this next one needed a reprint as well. It's Adrix and Nev Twin Casters, currently sitting at $19.50. This is a token doubler uh, on a green and blue creature. Um, well, a pair of creatures, I suppose. Uh, it's really good. Doubles the number of clues that you're going to make. And uh, I love that this is included because it's exactly kind of the kind of card that we would want in the upgrade. Yeah. Like, th- this is one we would have found and put in. And mm-hmm. then we're like, oh, it's already there. Yep. Perfect. Uh, the next uh, high-value reprint is Tulane, Teller of Tales, uh, which... You've probably played against it if you play a lot of Commander. Uh, It basically just whenever you cast a creature spell, you draw a card, and then you can put a land card from your hand in the battlefield. Uh, It can also bounce creatures to your hand. Mm. But, I mean, Tulane on his own uh, is just a really powerful Commander, and he was $16. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Chulain is a little funky in this deck, I will admit. Like, normally Chulain goes in decks with very cheap creatures and a lot of them. Uh-huh. So you're casting, like, two, one, two, even three mana creatures and drawing cards off of and them. And you just chain it together and right. you like, cast this, draw this, cast that, draw that. This deck has a lot more of, like, four like four or five and even some really high top-end yeah. mana value creatures, which is uh, makes Chulain a little bit worse. He is the sort of card, though, that's just good enough. He's just good. Like, I probably wouldn't have put him in the deck if I was building this from scratch, but he's not going to be bad. Speaking of just good, the next card is Coma, Cosmos Serpent. Yeah. Sitting at $16. Another sort of strange include in this deck, but again, a raw, powerful card that makes tokens. So it sort of goes along the token path that the deck wants. I don't need to know any more context about the deck you're playing. If you play Coma, it's going to be very powerful. Yeah. The next card is Alondra Sky Dreamer. I'm very excited about this reprint. This, uh-huh. this was in Jumpstart, I believe, was the original printing, and it is sitting at $14. Um, but this is whenever you draw your second card, you make a drake, and whenever you draw your fifth card, all of your drakes uh, grow really big. That's you pretty cool. You can slam the door on a game if you make enough drakes. So this goes along with the draw two thing that your commander is doing and is a great include in the deck. Yeah, I mean, th- this card can be a win condition if you really have gotten out all the yeah. clues and you're making can drakes every turn and then you just yeah. pow, fly them all in. Uh, next one is Farewell at $9, a powerful board wipe. Nice to have a reprint. Uh, then Finale of Revelation, $7.50. This is a draw X spell. Uh, a little funky in the deck, but it draws cards. It, it also makes it so you eventually have no hand size if it was big enough, which yeah. is a little redundant with your commander. With your commander, right? Yeah. You uh, have no, no this hand is the size. one if it's big enough, you untap. Oh, yeah. yeah and you have no that. maximum hand size for Yeah, the you're right. Game. You're right. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Academy Manufacturer, we've already mentioned, it's sitting at $7. Happy to have the reprint. For good reason, yeah. Kappa Cannoneer is at $5.50. This one uh, will get a counter anytime, a, likely a clue enters the battlefield and will become a big unblockable threat. It also is improvised, so it's a little cheaper to cast. Hydroid Crisis, which is uh, an X spell with blue and green that just basically draws you cards and gains you life and makes a big flying trampler on the battlefield when you Pretty play good. it. Pretty good. Also, it's a jellyfish hydra beast. Oh, yes. classic Simic. Simic <laughs> creature type. Oh, yeah. Wow. 
Uh, Teferi's Ageless in- Insight is one of the cards that I mentioned. This one's sitting at $5. It's two blue blue for a legendary enchantment. If you would draw one card, you draw two. Talk about value. Pretty now nice. you're like when you, you pay two to crack a clue and you're drawing two cards, that That's feels actually way better. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Because, cause, you know, clues are nice, but they always feel a little bad when you have to crack clues instead of, like, like casting progressing your board. Your mana. Yeah. So that makes it really good. Yeah, I mean, looking at this list of repents, we have five cards that are over $10 and well over $10. That means that the reprint value of this deck is going to be way higher than we've come to expect for these decks. It's pretty impressive, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, without any further ado, the total reprint value for this deck is... One hundred and eighty-nine dollars and seventy-five cents. That's bananas. That's nuts. That's crazy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> like for a forty-dollar, like I've seen it listed for anywhere between forty dollars and forty-five dollars. Yeah. So it depending on where you're shopping for it. If you can, if you can get it at forty-five dollars, like let's just say you find one on the higher end, that means for every one dollar you're spending, you're getting four dollars and twenty-two cents of reprint value. Yeah, I mean, honestly, there's enough cards in this that yeah. I'm just like, well, it's kind of good to have those. Though. Yeah, I mean, these are just good cards that you play, right? It's nice to have another Academy manufacturer. It's nice to have another Hydroid Crisis. Farewell. These are all just solid magic cards that we need in our collection as magic players. Now, of course, there's no way to like tell this now, but I know like when we did some of the Ixalan ones, we came and we were like, oh, it's, you know, listing Mm -hmm. at $40 and a lot of the prices went up, but not all of them. So, I mean, this is definitely worth keeping an eye on and hoping. I will say I... I really, if this is a trend, yeah. which so far we've had, Ixalan has had really, really high reprint value, uh-huh. and now Murders at Karlov Manor has had very, very high reprint value. That represents a real shift in how Wizards has done pre-cons, and it is a shift that we are extremely excited about. I, I love that. Especially, yeah. like, so many people, the pre-cons are like an entry to right. the format for them. And if you really feel like you got something good out of that, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I love that you can just buy one box and it's going to have a lot of the cards that you're seeing on gameplay channels that you're like, yeah, I have that card. Yep. I don't have to buy another one. I don't mm-hmm. have to spend $10, $15 on, on picking up cards that I feel like I should just have. It just lowers the barrier yeah. to entry to really feeling like you're playing good, powerful, cool commander. And that's anyway fantastic. We're excited about it. Thank we you. We like it. <laughs> uh, okay. Without further ado, let's get into this upgrade. Um, This deck, again, has a couple of different directions. We're doing some stuff that's just make tokens. Mm -hmm. We're doing some stuff that says draw two cards a turn. And then we're doing some stuff that says clues. Right. So we have to sort of marry those. Yeah, and they all kind of work together. Kind of work together. What I decided to do was sort of slim down some of the just token stuff, really focus on using the clues to draw the additional cards, yeah. and then find a way to um, make sure your commander hits really hard or trigger some of those win cons, which are often draw twos. Like there's Jorael is in this deck, I believe, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, the Alondra Sky Dreamer is like a good win con for this deck. Sure, well. it makes sense. So... Um, the first thing I wanted to add was make sure that this deck was making enough clues. Uh, so I added a Doctor Who card, Blasphemy, <laughs> Sarah Jane Smith. Oh, Sarah Jane, the first companion from the first Doctor yeah, Who. Yeah, just a lady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite thing about Doctor Who cards is they're just like a guy. It's just a people. Get in here. <laughs> I like summoned the Smith. battlefield for war. <laughs> Dan Lewis. Uh, I play Todd. I don't think it's a Todd (laughs) card, but still, that's funny. Uh, Sarah Jane Smith says whenever you cast a historic card, you make a clue. It only triggers once each turn, but this is a two drop. So it comes down before your commander Mm -hmm. and cast it on two, cast your commander on three, trigger Sarah Jane Smith, untap, you have another clue. Uh, Plus this deck is full of historic spells. I think there's like 21 of them. That's pretty good. Mana rocks and legends and artifact creatures. Um, and we are adding a number of them in this upgrade as well. Yeah, so that's that's going to get you pretty consistently a, a couple yeah. more clues and stuff, which seems pretty nice. Yeah, plus she's only 50 cents. The next one you have on the list here is Sage of Latnam, which is one in a blue for a 1-2 human artificer, which has tap, sacrifice an artifact, draw a card, which is just like a discount on a clue. Yep. Really nice. It feels like a mana rocket. 
here. So you, you're not, especially in the early games, you want to be cracking the clues to trigger your commander to make her bigger, but you don't want to be spending the t- precious mana in those early turns Absolutely. doing it. Mm-hmm. So having something that just lets you crack it for free that comes down before your commander means your gameplay is getting started early. Uh, so I think it looks like a small deal, but this card is going to feel pretty good, especially in your opening hand. Well, and it's going to feel like even better if you do manage to start getting stuff like the Academy Manufacturer mm. out, which is making these other tokens tokens and artifacts yeah. and that kind of thing. It, it's just a nice piece all around for this deck. Yep. 75 cents for the Sage of Latinam. Uh, the next one I'm excited to include, it's Grand Architect. Uh, this is one blue blue for a Vidalcan Artificer. A Vidalcan. Oh, it fits, yeah. This is uh, officially a Vidalcan deck now. Officially. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell wizards it's a Vidalcan deck. I guess. Uh, <laughs> I it's no a way. one three Vidalcan artificer. It says other blue creatures you control get plus one plus one. Sure. A uh, blue target artifact creature becomes blue until end of turn. Sure. <laughs> the, it, tap an untapped blue creature you control. Add colorless, colorless. Spend this mana only to cast artifact spells or activate abilities of artifacts. So sort of per, cre- per creature you have on the board, yeah. you can pay one blue to turn it into... Uh, clue cracking mana or if it's already yeah, blue or if it's already can... blue you just tap it yeah <laughs> what I like about it is that you don't need summoning sickness so it's really good with something like Alana where you make a drake you can tap the drake immediately yep. to crack a clue to just keep churning through things right mm-hmm. does she make she makes a drake whenever you draw your second card yep so it, it just gives you another way to crack clues without spending your mana and it's a Vidalcan so it's good. Yeah, that seems huge. <laughs> the next one on the list here is Krark Clan Ironworks, which is four. I mean, you've probably heard of this card if you've played Commander for a while. This is four yeah. mana for an artifact, and it says sacrifice an artifact, add two colorless to your mana pool. Yeah, this is a huge chunk of the budget. This is a $30 yeah. card, but it's worth it, right? KCI is the kind of card that it's really nice to have one in your collection. Oh, yeah. And in a deck like this that wants to crack the clues and needs, like, has some sort of artifact Mm -hmm. stuff going on, it's going to do a lot of what your deck does. And then if you don't even keep this deck together, there's going to be a place for the KCI later. So I actually really like investing in in one copy of this card. Oh, yeah. It's totally worth it. I mean, decks like this, there's going to be times where you, like... Drop down mm. KCI yeah. and sacrifice all your clues on the board and like dump out a hydroid crisis, which is just going to draw you like 15 a ton of cards. cards. And yeah, win exactly. The game, basically, like so, this card is so powerful. It's really going to push uh, things over the edge here, and it goes with a card that we're going to talk about in just a second. Uh, so I think I think KCI is worth spending 30 bucks on, but if you don't have 30 to spend, you can have a nice cheap upgrade without doing yeah. it. Uh, the next one I love to put in any deck, it's Thran Turbine. This is a single dollar for a single mana artifact that adds two colorless to your mana pool during your upkeep. So it's really good in decks that have activated abilities. Kind of a bizarre a of, card, though, A little right? weird. It's a soul ring that only works right, like, in a very <laughs> narrow window. Yeah. <laughs> And in this deck that makes a clue in your upkeep, it just says you draw an extra card in your upkeep when you control your commander. Yeah. <laughs> so it it turns your commander into a t- little bit of an engine. I like that it's a really efficient way to spend that two mana without, again, chunking up your mana base. This is just such a funny card to me because... Yeah. It feels like it almost like can't do anything else. I know. <laughs> but it sure does this pretty well. It's good when your commander has activated abilities. Like I used yeah. to run it in like a Kenrith deck where you just need like free colorless mana you can put to work. Yeah. But in a deck that has clues or wants to sack clues specifically like this one does, it seems great. Yeah, I- I'm in. Sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> uh, the next section... Uh, is for all of the clues you didn't sacrifice, which is uh, going to be some of them because it is actually hard to sacrifice all the clues you have. I mean, if you've ever played a clue deck or watched someone play a clue deck, yeah, you will be sacrificing some of them to draw cards, but you're mm. also just going to get a big pile of clues. Right. Uh, it's it's much easier to make clues than sacrifice them, so it is pretty fun to put them to work in the end game with cards like Rise and Shine. Yes. 
Uh, so two mana sorcery. It says target on creature artifact you control becomes a zero zero artifact creature. Put four plus one plus one counters on each artifact that became a creature this way. Weird wording. Unless nope. it said overload for blue blue. So you pay six mana and, and then, all your clues turn into guys. Yeah, you, you have like weird roundabout blue yeah. crater hoof behemoth. <laughs> Not exactly <laughs> that, but I picture Rise and Shine like the uh, be our guest scene oh. in in <laughs> Beauty and the Beast. Uh, you see, I was also thinking of a Disney scene, but I yeah. was thinking of the sorcerer's apprentice. Okay. When he, like Wh- starts moving the mm-hmm. getting mm-hmm. the brooms and stuff to move. Well, I think that might be what it's actually referencing. Yeah, it's got the... like a book walking and a spring and that kind of thing. I I go be Beauty and the Beast every time with this yeah. card. But it definitely takes all of that useless stuff that you've been making, all of your academy at manufacture, like extra artifacts, and says, actually, it's 30 power now. Can you uh, beat that? Pretty good. And it's only 50 cents. Yeah, they've reprinted it a lot. The next card on the list is Cyber Drive Awakener, which is five and a blue for a 4-4 four, four artica- artifact creature construct. It has flying and other artifact creatures you control have flying. Uh, when Cyber Drive Awakener enters the battlefield until end of turn, each non-creature artifact you control becomes an artifact creature with base power and toughness, 4-4. Four, four. Yeah, this is another way to put those clues to battle. <laughs> it, it just awakens all the clues. And says, and they <laughs> they fly now, so it's so much scarier. Yep. The first one's magic, and this one's like steampunk <laughs> just <laughs> murder nonsense. clues. It's just like a magnifying glasses whizzes, whizzing through the air. Yep. Um, it's a great win con. It's worth $6.50, um, especially if you're really dedicating into the make a lot of stuff plan. If you have one of these in your hand, maybe you slow down on cracking the clues and start to accumulate some. Yeah. Uh, the next one is one of my favorites in any deck that's trying to sacrifice um, art- artifacts like treasure decks or clue decks, uh, even food decks if you're sacrificing them. It's Aetherworks Marvel. It's a four-mana legendary artifact. Whenever a permanent you control is put into a graveyard, you get one energy. And then you tap it, pay six energy. So if you've sacked six clues or if six things have left the battlefield, uh, like even when you crack a fetch or something like that, that works. Look at the top six cards of your library. You may cast a card from among them without paying its mana cost. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. I love this card. This just does crazy things when it's on the battlefield. And it's not like... You know, it's not necessarily you crack it once and you win, but mm-hmm. if you can start getting to the point where you're pretty consistently putting more energy mm-hmm. on it and cracking it every turn, you're going to do crazy, powerful, nutty things. Yeah. And it's real fun. It's really, really fun to <laughs> yeah. play with. And it goes along well with this sort of strange top end that exists in the deck, like uh-huh. the comas that you're like, I don't, am I just going to tap out to cast coma? Is that the plan? Aetherworks Marvel is like, I got you. If you find your coma in the top six cards, it puts it right into play. The next card on the list is In Too Deep. This is Blue Blue for an enchantment aura with split second, uh, which means that, you know, you can't respond to it with spells uh, and abilities. It's it's a whole thing. Look it up. (laughs) Um, It's an enchant creature, planeswalker, or clue. Enchanted permanent is a colorless clue artifact with... Two, sacrifice this artifact, draw a card, and loses all their abilities. So this deck is light on on interaction. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It really needs additional removal pieces. And I put in too deep in because it's a cool, flavorful uh, <laughs> inclusion. Uh, you could obviously put in uh, can more counter spells. You could put in, uh, I think it has swords, but it's missing path. It like it, The more interaction, staply sweet. But in too deep is fun. It's a clue deck. You can be like, get a clue. Yeah. <laughs> it's also funny for commanders. It gives it like an additional two, <laughs> two commander attacks. Yeah, that's funny. Because <laughs> it turns it into a clue. So now they have to pay two to sack it you and then crack two more it first. to cast it. <laughs> That's hilarious. It doesn't I never thought it. about it that way. It doesn't lock it there. They can get <laughs> rid of it, but they do have to pay two, uh, which is fun. Uh, only 50 cents for in too deep. And the final card I wanted to add was Gem Razor for $1.50. Um, Gem Razor is a mutate creature. Uh, you can mutate it for one green green. And whenever this creature mutates, destroy target artifact or enchantment an opponent controls. It also has reach and trample. So a neat trick you can do with Gem Razor is you mutate it onto your commander, who isn't a human, importantly, 
and it will give your commander reach and trample and a larger base. Uh, but now all of those counters that you've been accruing on your commander suddenly have trample. <laughs> Which is great because, I mean, mm-hmm. I think we were talking a bit about it before the show. Yeah. There are so many token decks now that are making a lot of little, like, 1-1 one, one mm-hmm. artifacts or fungus or whatever that if you have a, a commander that's growing bigger and bigger and you're trying to win with that mm-hmm. commander damage or something, you're just not going to get in without giving it evasion. Some. You need something. You need trample or flying or unblockable or something. It's not good enough just to be big Mm -hmm. like at some point past maybe five five it's just doesn't matter how big it is is until it has evasion so and the cool thing about this is nobody's gonna see it coming so they're like ah i can block that not a big deal mutate it is trample now you're dead yeah because no one remembers mutate cards yeah exactly uh so i like gem razor because it kind of does two things it adds a little bit of interaction for your deck and gives your commander a little bit of evasion yeah of course, we have added 10 cards. It is time to take 10 cards out. Um, this is always the hardest part of these decks, but uh, I tried to take out some of the cards that didn't either fit the synergy or just aren't quite good enough. Uh, the first one I have tried to play, and I do not think it is powerful enough. Uh, it's Confirm Suspicions. Three blue blue for an instant. It says counter target spell investigate three times. These cards are traps. Like these big expensive expensive counter spells. Too often you'll be like, ooh, I've got this big counter spell. I'm going to pass with all this mana open. And then when it comes back to your turn, you regret that you did it. The the weird thing about this one is like if this was a four mana counter spell, I would think about it because that's holding two clues open, yeah. right? Five mana counter spell means you're holding up six mana essentially in this mm-hmm. deck. Like big I like I don't mind having a big impactful counter spell if your deck is naturally holding up a ton of mana. But if it isn't, then this is gonna be really clunky and it's just gonna feel impossible to use. Well, and another thing that makes good counter spells good is often they'll cast like, you know, a big six mana haymaker right. that's gonna end the game for them, and you spend one and cast Swan Song and exactly, you, yeah. you stop it. But mm-hmm. you're almost always going to get mana disadvantage on this while you were also holding stuff up. It's just inconvenient. I agree. Yeah. Uh, the next one is a Organic Extinction. Uh, this is eight white white for a sorcery with Improvise, so you can tap clues uh, t- to cast it is the idea. But then it says destroy all non-artifact creatures. This is an amazing board wipe in a an artifact, artifact creature, creature deck. deck. <laughs> um, it is has five artifact creatures in it before with the upgrade. And so there's some of those are very good. Like it yeah. has Academy Manufacturer. It has the the turtle that I forgot its name already. Kappa Cannoneer. Right. Like those are good cards in the deck, but you're not likely to have it. And now you're just tapping all of your clues to to just have a Wrath of God. And the problem too is if you haven't built your deck around artifact creatures, yeah. there's at least a chance someone on the board is going to come out much better than you. For sure. It's a one-sided <laughs> board wipe that isn't on your side. Yeah. <laughs> If I think about, like, the last five games I've played, if I wasn't playing an artifact deck, this would yeah. be terrible. Yeah. It, it's also, like, if you have eight clues to make this worth two white, yeah, you're, you're doing, doing good. Like, you don't need a board wipe. You just try and win now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that one got cut. The deck still has plenty of board wipes without it. Uh, the next one I cut was Psychosis Crawler. It says whenever you draw a card, each opponent loses one life. And I know you're like, Rachel, we're drawing cards. That's the point. <laughs> but it's it's such a, a little nitpicky, tiny little cuts and bits yeah, and that whole thing. Yeah, Psychosis Crawler's five mana. If you're not casting a wheel after this, it is not worth it. You know what I'd rather do than Psychosis Crawler? What? Probably just crack two clues. Just, <laughs> yeah, just draw two cards, yeah. right? It's that's the other thing because I was cutting an artifact creature for the organic <laughs> extinction. Um, it's it, it's just not that kind of deck. Like it's a draw cards deck, but it's not exactly going to kill you. It's not going to draw forty cards. Yeah, you know, to drain somebody of forty life points. If you're just like wheeling over and over again, Psychosis Crawler is amazing. Yeah, I agree. But this ain't that. Uh, the next one you have on the list here is Search the Premises, mm-hmm. which is three and a white for an enchantment, and whenever a creature attacks you or a planeswalker you control, investigate. This isn't a deterrent to attacking you. It's not a particularly good payoff for them yeah. attacking you. It just gives you, like, it could give you three clues a turn if things are going very, very ba- badly for you. And yeah. not to mention, like, 
you have a giant commander that isn't evasive. Like you're likely to have a really big blocker. It's not yeah. like you're just going to be attacked all the time. I, I guess I'll correct and say it could give you way more than that if they attack you with a bunch of creatures. Yeah, whenever because a creature a attacks creature. you, yeah, you could get m a bunch. Man, but that's not worth it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't like running, especially four mana cards that don't do anything unless my opponents do something. Yeah. Um, especially not something that my opponents aren't guaranteed to do. Obviously, Smothering Tithe, my opponents are guaranteed to draw cards. Well, and it's not like it's even drawing you a card when they attack you. It's giving you a clue, which, yeah, the deck can use, but then you got to crack it. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're already jumping through a lot of hoops here. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that card is uh, quite good enough for this deck. Uh, the next one is Magnifying Glass. I get the joke. Yeah, they put uh, it in because it's cute. It's a detective set. It's a three-mana artifact that adds colorless, and then it pays four, tap it to investigate. You're never going to activate that. You're nope. never going to do it. Um, and you have a three-mana commander that needs all of its colors. This it's is not funny. a good mana rock in the deck. Boy, if you just love the detective flavor. Keep it you in. Know, keep it. <laughs> Um, this next one doesn't have any detective flavor. It's Hornet Queen. Why? <laughs> four green, 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 flying death touch. When Hornet Queen enters the battlefield, create four one one green insect creature tokens with flying and death touch. I mean, it makes a lot of makes flying. Makes a lot of tokens. Yeah. And flying in green is pretty rare. Yeah. So that's neat. They're like, it'll give you some defense, I guess. Yeah. You're know, like, I suppose. This is a fine card in some decks. It's fine. I, it's weird in this deck. I don't think you need it, and I think there's better finishers, and we just added them. It would be really good in, like, an Essex Fractal Bloom deck. Yeah, which we're cutting. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler! <laughs> the, the next card in the list is Essex Fractal Bloom, which made me a little sad because I really do like Essex, and mm -hmm. I like it in decks like this. But the weird thing about... Oh, I suppose I should, I should read it. It says, the first time you would create one or more tokens during each of your turns, you may instead choose a creature other than Essex and create that many tokens that are copies of that creature. Can be super powerful. It can be very, very powerful, but it is the first time on your turn. Yep. And you have a commander that says you make a token in your upkeep. Which just turns it off, kind of. Yeah, it just means that the best thing that could happen is you play Essex. Like, if you have your commander on board, which you're probably going to do, that's the idea. You have your commander on board, you play Essex, you've already made a token, so you can't trigger it this turn. You wait until your upkeep, you make one token, and you clone one thing. Yeah. That's not good enough for six mana and a whole turn rotation. No. You, you want to be playing, like, a dedicated... Essex deck or a deck that, you know, is made to make like six tokens in one yeah. big thing, you know, like the friggin' yeah. wasp lady we were just talking about. Yeah. Whose name I've forgotten, but everyone knows Hornet Queen. <laughs> Hornet <Wasp> Queen. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, Hornet <laughs> Queen. <laughs> Who? It's, I, I, I love the idea of Essex in this deck. It just doesn't really work with this commander. You shouldn't include cards in your commander deck that only work if your commander's not on the board. Yep. Uh, the next one is Graph Mole. It says when you sack a clue, you gain three life. Fine. This is fine. Yeah. It, it's like, honestly, if it was on the board and you were cracking some clues, it's probably pretty good for you. Yeah. But I don't like having a three drop that's only good if you're already set up. Yeah, and it's not like it like makes it easier for you to sacrifice clues. It doesn't no. reduce their price or do anything like that. It just gives you a little bit more. Yeah. Don't There's underestimate life gain, but I, I don't think it's quite what you want. The next one you have on the list here is Nadir Kraken, which is one blue blue for a two three, and whenever you draw a card, you may pay one. If you do, put a one one counter on Nadir Kraken and create a one one blue tentacle creature token. Neat sometimes. It's already expensive to crack clues. A lot of the draw engine from this deck comes from cracking clues. Paying yep. an additional one to make to get value out of it is just so much mana. Yeah, it, it's it's a little backbreaking, and just kind of getting, you know, one ones out of it. And it's a slightly big, bigger crack. And you've got a plenty big commander. You'll be okay without it. Yep. Uh, the final cut is Finale of Revelation. This is the X spell that we mentioned in the beginning. It's blue, blue X for a sorcery that draws cards. If X is 10 or more, it never will be. Uh, unless you, I guess, if you have the Inspiring Statuary or, or something. Um, I build only, I build almost exclusively big mana decks, so yeah. I disagree, but yeah. <laughs> it's not going to be in this deck. <laughs> you untap five lands and, and you have no maximum hand size. I, I think this deck doesn't want to draw 30 cards all at once. It wants to draw two a turn. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's just sort of different. Yeah. Uh, if it was instant speed, maybe. Yeah, it would make a big difference. And the final card. Well, th that is that, that that's is all, technically... That's the 10 cards. That is technically yes. the 10 cards that you should cut from this deck. Those are the 10 that we are recommending that you cut. 
But, but you but, should probably cut coma. What is <laughs> coma doing there? <laughs> Look, let's be it's real. A great rebrand. I am not mad that Coma's in the deck. It is weird here. We we've had extra turns though. Yeah. Where it was like me and you and someone yeah. played a coma and we go, All right, everyone needs to someone, deal with coma. Jamie. <laughs> it was Jamie. It was Jamie Block. <laughs> he played a coma. That crazy guy. Yeah. Uh, so it is powerful. It's really, really good. So, like, it feels weird to recommend you to take it out. It just isn't very synergistic. It feels like there's a deck. Like, maybe just take Coma out and put it in a deck where Coma's more flavorful yeah. or makes more sense mechanically. It but will make you the enemy. It's really it good. Deck. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. You could leave it in. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. It also makes a lot of sense to cut it. It doesn't really do what this deck is yeah, trying to do. Yeah, it's also cus uh, casting a seven drop in this deck is not like, it's not like a big mana deck, really. It's just a little weird. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's that's the upgrade for the Deep Clue C. This precon's awesome. We're going to talk about it a little bit uh, at the end of the episode when we compare the two precons. But up next, we are going to upgrade the Blame Game precon. It's red, it's white, it's all about goad, and we will get to that upgrade after a few words from our sponsors. Hey, everybody, for the new Game Nights Murders at Karlov Manor episode, we are doing our first ever live watch party. That's right, February 8th at 2.30 p.m. Pacific. We're going to be watching this episode live on Whatnot. We'll be telling fun behind-the-scenes stories, answering questions, and, of course, giving away free stuff the whole time, specifically Karlov Manor Collector Booster. Yeah, we're going to be giving our thoughts, our reactions. It's going to be like watching DVDs, you know, the director's commentary. Do they still do that? DVDs or director's commentary? Both. Oh, long gone. No, well, that's a shame. Anyway, we've been having a lot of fun on Whatnot. More fun than I expected, honestly. And we're really excited about the new kinds of content it's letting us experiment with. And that's not all, because The Professor is going live right after our stream ends, and he's giving away a bunch of stuff also, including, and this is something I'm personally super excited about, boxes of OG Conspiracy. Oh man, I love that set. Do you think it'd be weird if I won one of those giveaways? Yes, that would be fairly sus. Okay, fair enough. So to make sure you don't miss any of it, sign up at whatnot.com slash invite slash command. It'll automatically bookmark our stream so you're notified the second we go live and you'll get 15 bucks free to spend anywhere on the platform. Yeah, at the very least, you may as well cash in those 15 free dollars and come watch Game Nights with us. Trust me, I've got a lot to say about this one and I will not be silenced. Who would silence you? We're in charge. Again, that's whatnot.com slash invite slash command. See you there. Hi, I'm Zealous Conscripts, and this is the love of my life, my Valentine. Yeah, it's me, Kiki Chiki. <laughs> On our own, we're both good cards, but together our potential is unlimited. It's combo time! That's, That's the, the power, power of a good, good pairing. pairing. And you know what I've been pairing lately? My Raycon wireless earbuds with my favorite audiobook, Infinite Jess. <laughs> so much jest! We both use our Raycons every day. The audio quality is incredible, and they're just half the price of other premium brands. The eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life are perfect for indeterminately long walks with our cat, Fella Dog Guardian. Good kitty, good kitty! And Kiki loves the optimized gel tips and perfect in-ear fit because they never fall out no matter how fast he combos on. Of course, our favorite feature is the noise isolation mode, so we can enjoy a quiet night by the fire. Just him, me, and 12,000 additional copies of me. Watchy, watchy. Go to buyraycon.com slash command today to get 15% off your Raycon order plus free shipping. That's buyraycon.com slash command to score 15% off and free shipping. Again, buyraycon.com slash command. I think it might need more card draw. Who are you talking to? Or is that just something you say? Oh, no, I'm on a call with Jimmy. We're uh, building a Chatterfang deck. Ooh, I just added Toski. That should help, right? Whoa, the card just showed up. Yeah, with Architect, you can collaborate in real time from anywhere in the world. Changes show up immediately. You don't even have to reload the page. So it's perfect for brewing with a friend. This is cool, but isn't Jimmy just upstairs? Yeah, but I'm I'm downstairs right now. I ain't coming downstairs. Architect is the best place to browse, brew, and playtest commander decks. Just go to architect.com slash command zone to get started. That's A-R-C-H-I-D-E-K-T dot com slash command zone. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. We are upgrading the Blame Game Precon this time. We just finished upgrading Deep Clue C, uh, but we're going to upgrade the Boros Goad Precon from Murders at Karlov Manor. This deck is built around goad and sort of combat control type stuff. Yeah. But specifically, it showcases the suspect mechanic or yeah. suspect mechanic. Which, if, if a card is suspected, if you mm -hmm. use it on, it's not a counter, it's just a state that is given to it that doesn't go away. Yeah. Then that means that card cannot block 
and has menace. Yeah. So it's a it's it, it turns it into a better attacker and a non blocker and a worse blocker. Uh, we're going to get into the face commander and tell you a little bit more about this deck before we get to the upgrade. Let us meet her. The face commander of this deck is Nelly Borka, impulsive accuser. Whoa, Nelly, as I have started calling her. <laughs> you can't just go around accusing everybody. <laughs> Whoa, Nelly. Whoa, Nelly. <laughs> uh, All right. You don't, you can't, you don't know anything about that. But she can. She's impulsive. <laughs> she just does it. That's how it goes. Uh, she is two red white for a two four legendary creature human detective uh, with vigilance. And whenever Nelly Borka impulsive accuser attacks suspect target creature, then goad all suspected creatures. Uh, whenever one or more creatures an opponent controls deal combat damage to one or more of your opponents, you and the controller of those creatures each draw a card. Okay, so there's sort of a lot to digest here. Yeah. It's whenever she attacks, she suspects a, any creature, Which right? doesn't mean she has to attack, and she is a 2-4 yeah. with Vigilance, which is an amazing attacker. You could suspect Nelly to give her menace. I guess you could, yeah. But a 2-4 isn't incredibly difficult to... Uh, double block. To double block, yeah. and then she's goaded. Uh-huh. Which I guess no, the, she won't be goaded because it'll wear off on your upkeep. Because uh, when she attacks, she goads. Sure, yes, yeah, yeah. You're so correct. That, that's how that works. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> but it's yeah, it is difficult to attack with Nelly safely. Um, and then that second bit is like a static thing that whenever a creature an opponent controls, so not yours, deals combat damage to one or more of your opponents, you and the controller of those creatures each draw a card. So you can draw a maximum of one. Per opponent's turn. Per opponent's attack, yes. Yeah, you, you don't draw anything on your turn. Yeah. My, my initial thought reading this card mm. is that it kind of reminded me of like a Boros Breen of the Demagogue, which is you yeah. know, a deck I play and I like, and mm. it, it does a similar sort of thing where... It rewards people for attacking each other so that you can right. not have the heat on you. They're sort going to quietly you. gain some value here. And and it does feel like the, the pieces sort of fit together mm -hmm. because if all the creatures out there are suspected, then people aren't able to block each other. They have better attackers. Yeah, it was very interesting to me because in, in the main set, suspect is a very aggressive mechanic. It's yeah. like you want your creatures to be suspected and have menace or you make one of their creatures unable to block so you can keep attacking. Mm -hmm. And Nelly turns this aggressive mechanic and sort of makes it defensive she's like yeah she's like you're gonna play an aggro deck <laughs> in commander which we know is a little bit underpowered well and, and again like that that's how i play my brina deck yeah that's how this sort of thing works out because right. when you're getting an advantage when they attack each other a lot of times you want to let them build up their aggression for each other you yeah. want you know the next person to attack you know the opponent across mm. from you and then them to be upset and go, well, you attack me and I can get a card if I attack you and to start a big fight amongst yeah. them while you sit back and go, oh, he did I don't it. know why you guys are fighting. He did it. Yeah. She did it. Uh, yeah, it's it's very it's very interesting. And uh, let's talk about the best cards in the deck to kind of get to know what the 99 is doing here. Uh, I th the first one is just says says what you want to be doing. This has become one of my favorite cards in a lot of decks I love recently. It. Yeah. This is Disrupt Decorum. Mm. This is uh, two red red for a sorcery, and it says goad all creatures you don't control. Goad them. This just means the whole board attacks each other in the next turn. Uh, this can be a win condition. I agree. I, I consider Disrupt Decorum not a board wipe exactly, mm -hmm. but it has a similar effect where it takes the board and it goes, this board... This board's your problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> that, that board had too much decorum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it must be disrupted. It's just throw, it's throwing a tomato at somebody from under, you know, the table. And it, it, with Nelly, this will draw you three cards as well, hypothetically, as long as your opponents are capable of dealing combat damage to each other. Yeah, and I mean, there's at least a chance they all just know, like, well, my creatures are all going to die, so I block, block, block. But that yeah. probably still works out for you. Yeah. So I think this card, like, if you're sitting with this in hand and everyone else is you know, building their boards up, which is another way that it's like a board, it, it's like a board wipe. Yeah. Because sometimes it plays best when it seems like everyone else is in a better position than you. Right. Um, but you're going to play this, things are going to go very badly for your opponents for the mm. next turn and you'll be in a good place at the end of it. For sure. 
Uh, the next card I wanted to talk about was Rite of the Raging Storm. Super cool card. It's a three red red for an enchantment. It's creatures named Lightning Rager can't attack you or planeswalkers you control. Which is always a That's problem weird. when you're being attacked Although by Lightning, Lightning Ragers, Ragers, right? At the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player creates a 5-1 red elemental creature token named Lightning Rager. It has trample, haste, and at the beginning of the end step, sacrifice this creature. So I love this card. I think it has a lot of very cool synergies in a lot of decks. It's great in this deck because Perfect. it gives your opponents a free attacker that can't attack you. Yep. So it says you could draw a card. If you just attack somebody with this rager. Yeah, go ahead. It's free. It yeah. costs you nothing. Meanwhile, your life total is getting higher and higher. Well, not higher, but not changing. And everybody else raging is low. At you. Everybody else's life total is dropping by five every turn. And you've drawn three cards and they've all drawn one. Uh, so this one definitely... The biggest problem with this card is, is they're not goaded. Yeah. They don't have to attack with the rager. But your commander says, it would be good for you if you did. And uh, look, people love drawing cards. Yeah. If if people say, oh man, this is a good attack, no one is going to like, you know, block with their commander or a real yeah. card that they care about when it's this like 5-1 that's just going to go away anyway. Mm. So people will see that and say, oh, I could get a card out of that? Sign me up. Absolutely. Brings uh, us to... The final best card in the deck. I love this card. card. Man, when I saw this, I was like, it does what? I, I am pumped about this card. This is Trouble in Pairs. Uh, two white white for an enchantment it says, if an opponent would begin an extra turn, that player skips that turn instead. That doesn't do much, but sure. I love having it on a card. We'll take it. Uh, but then it also says, when an opponent attacks you with two or more creatures, draws their second card each turn, or casts their second spell each turn, you draw a card. Whenever an opponent attacks you with two or more creatures, so that's yep. the Mangara Clause, draws their second card each turn, so that's kind of like the the five, the one, the the Council of Four. There yes, we go. Yeah, Not Council the five. Four, right. We got there. Uh, or cast their second spell each turn, you draw a card. So you have the potential to draw three cards on your opponent's turn? Uh, you actually have potential to draw way more than three cards on your opponent's turn because the other opponents could also have cast stuff. In fact, I have calculated <laughs> that in a turn cycle, you could potentially draw 27 cards with this. You won't. <laughs> <laughs> but so you that could. so that would be is if if, if each every player, single player on your turn each of your opponents has to draw two cards and cast two spells on each opponent's turn each of the opponents draws two cards <laughs> and cast two spells yeah and then uh, the person whose turn it is attacks you with two creatures every turn so you draw seven <laughs> on each of their turns and then you draw six on your turn. This is not going to happen. <laughs> but whoa! <laughs> but, but what if? <laughs> What if, right? I will say when Mangara came out, everybody was kind of like, ah, this might draw you a card. And then I have a Mangara deck. It draws you at least two cards a rotation. And that just is on like the second spell and the attack thing. Yeah. The attack thing, it happens l much less. But drawing two cards in a turn is very, very easy. And casting two spells in a turn is very, very easy. I I can absolutely see this drawing you four cards at rotation. Absolutely. And people aren't going to stop doing these things. Like, they might stop attacking you, which is fine. Yeah. Like, it's great if people aren't attacking you because of this. But, right. like, I've heard a couple people online and, and around just be like, oh, it's kind of a, it can be a do-nothing enchantment a lot of the time. And I say, if this is a do-nothing enchantment. If nobody's attacking you with two creatures or drawing, drawing two cards, cards or casting two spells. You're winning. Then you're doing great. <laughs> things are going great. It's so good. <laughs> I, I love this card. I'm going to yeah. be putting this in tons and tons of white decks. <laughs> so those are designated three best cards. It's a little bit of goad. It's some creatures to let your opponents hit each other. And it's a ton of card draw in one box. Uh, we're going to talk about the most valuable reprints, the notable reprints, everything over $5 uh, in this box, of which there are six. Hmm. And the first one is a doozy. This is a $35 card at the moment, which is Fiendish Duo, which is four red red for a creature devil, 5-5, five, five, with first strike. And if a source would deal damage to an opponent, it deals double that damage to that player instead. It's a damage doubler for everybody except for you. Your, your damage is still regular. That's pretty good. 
pretty good. A little weird in a defensive deck, but a very, very strong reprint. This would be the first time this card is reprinted, I believe. Yeah, and, and you know, it sits there and it's, you don't, people don't love attacking into a 5-5 five, five, mm, uh, with, with first, first strike. strike. And it deals double damage. So it does pretty solid there. Oh and no, then, it only deals double damage to the pl a player, not, yeah, the, just not the, player. the creatures. Yeah. But then all their goaded creatures, which are going in and attacking people, they're going to have to block because mm -hmm. they would do a ton of damage and then they would lose their board or it's going to be getting in and doing, you know, a ton of damage. Just couldn't be a solid finisher if you can get everyone attacking each other. I mean, imagine, you know, having this out when you just pulled off a disrupt a quorum or something. Oh my gosh, an absurd turn. Uh, the next card is worth $16, a big reprint, one I'm excited for and perfect in this deck. It's Comeuppance. This prevents all damage that would be dealt to you and Planeswalkers you control this turn by sources you don't control. If damage from a creature source is prevented this way, Comeuppance deals that much damage to that creature. If damage from a non-creature source is prevented this way, Comeuppance deals that much damage to the source's controller. Great name for a card. Oh, yes. You're doomed. <laughs> You're about to get your comeuppance. <laughs> it's so good. And when comeuppance works, it's incredible. Yeah. You're like, you attacked me with all these creatures? Well, they're all dead. You shot me with an Aetherflux Reservoir? Well, you're dead. I, I love it because I think that's something you want to be doing in this mm, deck. I agree. You want to be like, if you attack them, you get cards. If you attack me... There's going to be some comeuppance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have to have answers like this, right? Because you sort of want to demonstrate on the first player that comes to you for you. Yeah. You need to slam them. It's like prison rules. The first person who attacks exactly. you, you need to like you make need to an have example. It. You need to deflecting palm them. Even if that isn't <laughs> the best use of deflecting palm. You got to do it. You need to lay down the law. They've got to go, it goes badly when I attack that person. Smack them on the wrists. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. I love comeuppance. Love this reprint. The next reprint is $9, and that's Lauren of the Third Path. Huge. Really, so really excited nice. for this reprint. So good. It ETBs, and it destroys an artifact or enchantment, and then it can tap to make you and an opponent each draw a card, which I like with yeah. the kind of politics-y thing going on. Exactly. In it's like, you didn't attack me. Very good. You get a treat. I put Lauren in a lot of white decks. I love anyway. this card. It's really good with Blink. It's really, like, the draw is great in a moment where you're behind, and you're like, you and me, we need to fix this, and you get to steal a little bit of their cards to try and answer our problem. She so cool. Lauren's so great. Huge reprint. Uh, Smuggler Share is two and a white for an enchantment. At the beginning of each end step, draw a card for each opponent who drew two or more cards this turn. Then create a treasure token for each opponent who had two or more lands enter the battlefield under their control this turn. This card has drawn me a few cards. I've had games where this has been really good. And some where it has done nothing. Yeah. Um, it, it sort of rhymes with Trouble in Pairs. Yeah. But the fact that Trouble in Pairs only draws you cards and this can sort of like get you treasures or it can, can sort of sometimes do this makes trouble it a little less reliable. Trouble in Pairs is a little more bulletproof than this. I, I, I mean, agree. There's going to be the, the two lands enter is a much rarer thing to happen than any of the stuff in Trouble in Pairs. And uh, the the cards will help you for certainly some time. It's just a little inconsistent. I like it, though. Still, $9.50. It's going to give you a lot of value, and this deck needs the card draw, I promise you. And a card that I would have been shocked if they didn't print in this uh -huh. deck. Ghostly Prison is the next one, which is two and a white, and it says creatures can't attack you unless their controller pays two for each creature they control that's attacking you. Attacking me is inconvenient. Yeah, totally. And I mean... It's a waste of your time. How many games have you been in where someone goes, okay, I'm going to attack you with five creatures, and you go, I have a Ghostly Prison on board, and they go, oh... Yeah, I'm going to attack him with five yeah, creatures. It's great. <laughs> I love Ghostly Prison because it doesn't, like, so they'll remove it when you're the last player alive. Yeah. But nobody removes it when they have other attacks. No. <laughs> Uh, the final reprint that is $5 or more is Darien, King of Kjeldor. Kjeldor. He's a $5 card and a very neat one. It's four yeah. white, white for a 3-3. Three, three. Whenever you're dealt damage, you and you may create that many 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens. That's neat. So if they do attack you, you get a little bit of um, uh, armed support uh, yeah. for the retaliation. <laughs> That's pretty good. Pretty nice. Uh, okay, those are the notable reprints in this deck. There are six, uh, one of which is $35. So there is a pretty good amount of reprint value in this deck, uh, like comparable to what we saw in Lost Caverns of Ixalan, and certainly good if you're picking up this deck for $40 or $45. The total reprint value of this deck is... $153.50. 
pretty good. Yeah. Not quite as good as the Deep Clue C. Yeah, for a, it's like a, an absurd number. Yeah. But it's um quite solid reprints for a very specific kind of deck. Yeah. Um, the Comeuppance reprint is really awesome. The, like, Lauren, if you're a white player, is enormous. Trouble in Pairs is going to be worth a ton of money. Yeah, and I, Phoenix uh, Duo, would guess. I had no idea it was that expensive. But. I know. I've never owned one, so I guess, like, that makes yeah. Sense. Remember, this value only represents the reprints in the deck. That's 71 of the cards. There could be additional value in the new cards. We don't have those numbers in front of us. And that value will, of course, go down over time because the cards They've have been, been reprinted. reprinted. That's how that works. Uh, if you would buy this deck at $45, you get $3.41 worth of reprints for your $1 cash. Pretty good. Pretty good. Triple your money. As long as you count magic cards as money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I do. <laughs> Personally. I, I I love this. I really hope that this is like the promise of, of uh, pre-cons to come. Because yeah. reprinting this these kinds of cards that aren't crazy powerful but are obnoxiously expensive is huge. Yeah, and lets you use them immediately, which is yep. very cool. All right, let's get into this upgrade. First, uh, before we talk about specific cards, I want to talk about your goals for this upgrade. So my goals for this upgrade is I feel that at least as it is out of the box, it is a little clunky and kind of missing some important things. Mm. So first things first, it, it's very low on card draw. Yeah. Like it just out of the box does not have much card draw and it doesn't have that much interaction. And I kind of feel those are both things you really, you know, just need a lot of mm -hmm. in this deck. Um, interaction, especially because you want to be, you know, threatening people. You want to be removing things that are getting out of hand and kind of keeping the board state mm -hmm. uh, a little even. And Especially because a lot of the interaction that's included in the deck is conditional. There's like yep. soul snares and that kind of thing that I believe it only exiles creatures that are attacking you. Which I get the joke there. I yes. get what the plan is. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, don't attack me or I'll remove your creature. Yeah. But you can do that with a bluff or not a bluff, like having something in your hand and right. saying it kind of thing too. And it's just better. Yeah, um, and it means that if somebody plays a Nyxplum Mansion, even if they're not attacking you with it, you can still remove it. And I think the important. idea of building the deck with less card draw in it like that is that, oh, but you know, everyone will be attacking each other and you could get a card on every opponent's turn with mm -hmm. your commander out. But I just don't think that that's always going to work as consistently as you want it to mm -hmm. um, because it's tough to attack with your commander, which is the way to suspect things. And to go on goad. board, yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to add more ways to goad, which the deck does have a lot of good ways to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I am trying to just increase how much you are getting by them attacking each other mm -hmm. and then just more card draw and interaction and stuff. Definitely. All right, let's talk about this first uh, group of cards. This is more th ways to incentivize uh, attacking your opponents or perhaps disincentivize attacking you. Yeah, and the first one, and this is the very first thing that came to mind uh, in this upgrade, is Firemane Commando. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a $3 card that is three and a white for a 4-3 uh, angel soldier flying. Whenever you, attack with two, or whenever you attack with two or more creatures, draw a card. Whenever another player attacks with two or more creatures, they draw a card if none of those creatures attacked you. Love this. Awesome. So gives you some of the some proactive draw, which is good. Mm -hmm. This gives you a four three flyer that can attack or block to help trigger itself, and it again like delivers more promise. Where it's like, if you go to battle for me, you will be rewarded. And this makes people like really go, "Ooh, I want to attack them." And mm -hmm. then other people see it and go, "Oh, that that greedy mm -hmm. guy <laughs> just attacked me for that card. I'm going to take it back on him." Yeah. Whereas opposed to sometimes. Uh, so I will say, this is one of the things I think is a bit of a conflict to this deck, yeah. is that people love drawing cards, and they will yes. attack for that. People hate their stuff being goaded. They do not like it. <laughs> they don't like it, and yeah. they will fight you for that. So I like making it a little bit more, you know, carrot than stick in this case. And I like that the next card does that. Yeah. Speaking uh, of stick. The next one's a stick. <laughs> <laughs> the next one's a stick, but, you know, if you're going to have a stick, carry a big stick. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is Slicer, Hired Muscle. This is $2.50. This is one of the Transformer mm -hmm. cards. And um, on the front side, it is a legendary artifact creature robot that is a 3-4 with double strike and haste. And at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, you may have that player gain control of Slicer until end of turn. If you do, untap Slicer, goad it, and it can't be sacrificed this turn. If you don't, convert it. 
And then it also has more than meets the eye, two and a red. If you haven't seen these cards mm. before, it means you can cast it on the backside as a car. Um, and on the backside, it is Slicer High Speed Antagonist. Uh, this is a legendary artifact vehicle, 3-2, with living metal, which means that when it's your turn, it's also a creature. It is first strike and haste, and whenever Slicer deals combat damage to a player, convert it at end of combat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um- all I wrote under Slicer was, your opponents don't want to attack? Make, Make them! <laughs> yeah. Oh, you don't want to attack for a card? Hit him with this police car. Hit him with a car. Yeah, is this a police car? It look, kind of looks like it. I don't know. I think no, it's, it's, it's definitely not. It's a muscle car. It's a tired muscle. I it think ha- there's the a joke. building in the art behind it that I thought was a well, siren. like a police? <laughs> yeah. yeah no. S- Slicer's a Septicon. He, yeah, yeah, he's yeah, a bad yeah. guy. He's not really a... Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Slicer is... It, Really good. <laughs> He's really good. And having this double strike haste that you pass around to every single creature that, again, isn't your problem. It kind of does the same thing as the lightning ragers. Where you're like, here's a free attack. You have to send it at an opponent. You're going to draw a card, but so am I. Blocking a 3-4 double striker profitably so annoying. is backbreaking. It's really, really hard. <laughs> especially early when Slicer is only a three mana to put on the battlefield with haste. And oh, yeah. then it flips over immediately. And if they're attacking with Slicer and you're drawing cards cards every turn it's gonna be great oh baby Mm -hmm. uh the next the next uh card that we add in this category is uh one we've already talked about a little bit absolutely it's my boy mingar the diplomat the diplomat yeah uh whenever an opponent attacks with creatures if two or more of those creatures are attacking you and or planeswalkers you control draw whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn draw uh, this is a great way to say, if you attack me, I get value out of it. Yeah. But if you attack other people, you get value out of it. Pretty nice. And also, I get value out of it. <laughs> um, again, the deck really, really needs card draw, and Mungar is a great blocker that gives you more cards. And that second spell clause really powerful. is just very good, because yeah. you want to be casting more than one spell a turn. Um, after these, the attack payoff cards, I just wanted to put in a couple really solid repeat, mm. or well, not necessarily repeatable, but just very efficient goad cards. And the first one is from Lord of the Rings. It is Taunt from the Ramparts. Uh, this is three red white uh, for a sorcery that says goad all creatures your opponents control until your next turn. Those creatures can't block. Nice. This is so powerful. This is everything your deck wants, this right? This is Disrupt Decorum, except it can't do the thing I was talking about where everyone decides to throw all their creatures in front of it to survive. And they're like, nope, you like, are getting hit and you are hitting. <laughs> and I'm going to be drawing. If you cast like, if you cast this card on a big enough board, there could just be one opponent left at yeah. the end. <laughs> a lot of the time when I've cast this card, people are just like... I guess I have to cast this board wipe or I die. Yeah. Like they, they'll just wipe the board whether it's good for them or bad for them because they need to, to do something. Well. But if they don't have the wipe, players die. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens. And of course. And you draw cards in the process. If you cast this in your first main phase too, you can just swing out at everybody. Yeah. They can't attack They're you like, back. What are you going to do? You couldn't. You can't block. <laughs> you can't attack me. I love it. It's Ain't it's nothing perfect you can do. in a deck like this, and it's honestly perfect in just about every Boros Aggro deck. Uh, the next one is one of my favorite magic cards uh, that they've printed, especially in the last couple of years. It's Bothersome Quasit. So bothersome. He's so bothersome. <laughs> two and a red for a 3-2 with Menace. It says, goaded creatures your opponent's control can't block. Gorgeous. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, goad target creature and opponent controls. Uh, Bothersome Quasit, it's a $4 card, and this deck is full of non-creature spells, 36 of them. Um, Now, every time you cast, like, one of these enchantments or one of, there's, like, the aura, the vow auras are in this, then you can be like, all right, this creature has to attack and I'll goad that. Even you cast a signet to ramp, you know, and you're like, and goad that. Go to war. Uh, it's perfect in this deck and uh, is going to draw you some cards in addition to just being a little bothersome. Yeah, and, and the goaded creatures your opponent's control can't block mm-hmm. is just always doing work because you're goading stuff all the time. Yeah, absolutely. So after the goad, uh, I wanted to disincentivize people attacking you a mm-hmm. little more directly, which uh, some of these cards also have kind of the twofer value that they make it a little easier to attack with your commander, yeah, for if sure. you want. So the first one of these is kind of a commander classic. This is Mother of Runes, mm-hmm. which is only 475 right now. Wow, that's great. This is just a one white mana for a 1-1 one, one creature, human cleric, and it has tap. Target creature you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn. 
Yeah, so Mother of Runes does a lot here. You can attack with your commander and give it protection from a color if somebody makes a block that's inconvenient for you. Mm -hmm. You can block with Mother of Runes and tap it to give it protection from the creature it's blocking. Yep. Um, or any creature protection, but usually it's the mother. Um, it, it, it's just going to do everything that you want in an aggressive slash defensive deck. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's just really nice. Uh, play with it a little while, you'll see what I mean. Um, this next card is a land. Yep. But don't play yeah, it as a land. It's not a land. Don't count it amongst your lands. It is like, a land. How many lands are in my deck? It's a maze of it. Yay! All Maze the way Vith. down to five dollars and fifty cents. Also, used to be really expensive. Yeah, Maze of Vith has been reprinted a lot, and it is because players really want to have it. It's a land that says it doesn't tap for mana, but it says tap, untap target, attacking creature, prevent all combat damage that will be dealt to and dealt by that creature this turn. So. Most of the time, Maze of Vith is used defensively, right? Yeah. Where it's like, you attacked me with a big thing, uh-oh, no. Well, and I'd say a ton of the time, Maze of Vith is just threat of activation. Yeah. Like, people are like, well, I want to attack and get my creature in on somebody. And you go, well, I've got a Maze of Vith. And they go, oh. I can't attack you, I guess. Well, maybe I'll attack one of them. And then guess what? You still have the Maze of Vith when the other people attack. It does a ton of work for you. But in this deck, if you need to get an attack trigger in with your commander uh, to goad some creatures that you've yeah. already suspected, you can attack with it, and then knowing that she would die in combat, you can activate your Maze of it and actually return your own commander uh, from combat Which and I've, so you won't die there. I've definitely done mm -hmm. in other decks. Yeah. Like, it, it's a nice mode that, you know, I think people not necessarily sometimes forget, but don't put it in deck thinking about sometimes. Right. It's just very versatile. Yeah. Uh, I love it in here. It's doing uh, double duty for you for $5.50. And then this is really like less that this is the be all and end all card, but more indicative of what I think if you're continuing to upgrade this deck, you should start to like think about putting mm -hmm. in, which is just more interaction um, to stop people from attacking you. And this is a classic generous gift, mm -hmm. which is two and a white for an instant and it destroys target permanent. Its controller creates a 3-3 three, three green elephant creature token. Now, I like this card mm -hmm. it you know it can just remove anything but i think it also fits particularly well in the plan of this deck because not only does it destroy something that's become a threat like you know an enchantment that's messing mm -hmm. up the whole board or something but it also gives them a creature which then they can attack with or you can goad and they can deal damage to other players and start mm -hmm. getting you cards off of it so yeah I, I agree. I, I think Generous Gift is, is really good in decks that are low on interaction mm -hmm. because then you have, at least when you draw it, you can answer any of the problems that are on the board. Yeah. Um, I tend to play more interaction spells and they're a little bit more narrow and a little bit more efficient. Um, but in this deck, you have to have the answer because you're threatening that you have the answer yep. a lot of the time. And like you, you're holding up comeuppance, you're holding up, uh, there's another like really sweet fog in this that's new that like fogs an attack and then gives somebody an extra combat. Oh, and then yes. And goaded. I can't remember what it was called. Oh, but it's so cool. Check out the deck list. In the link down yeah, below. There's some, there's some very cool like <laughs> fog type stuff going on here. So having you're going to have mana held up for a less efficient removal spell, and it'll mean that you can answer anything. And I think in like a ground up build of Woe Nelly, Borka, mm -hmm. um, I would have a lot of removal pieces. But I didn't want to just, you know, use this whole upgrade yeah, that's guide. Yeah, not fun for like, anybody. Removal, removal, removal. Yeah. Um, 75 cents for a generous gift. Uh, it'll be well used, I promise. So the last category is just sort of generic draw, and uh, mm -hmm. we sort of tried to make it also fit with the theme of the deck because, you know, it just makes more sense to try and have some synergy as it goes on. But this first one is honestly just a very solid card. It is mm -hmm. Professional Facebreaker, which is currently going for $9. We talk about this card a lot on the channel, and it is because it does so much. And in this Feels deck, it, it has Menace, so it's a great attacker. It can help trigger your attack with two creatures cards. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it gives you treasures for attacking. Like, you're making so many things unable to block, hypothetically, yep. that the, you can really take advantage of that with the face breaker. And you can sack those treasures and see extra cards, which this deck is sort of in desperate need of proactive draw. Yeah, it's really nice. And I mean, you don't even have to attack with Facebreaker itself mm. to be getting treasures off of attacking yeah. through people's can't block suspected creatures. So I think Facebreaker just kind of does it all. And then the final card. I love this include. Added. I, it's a little cute. And there's some positive yeah, element to Nelly fun. Borka. But I thought it was fun. So uh, it's Wedding Ring mm -hmm. for 850 And 
Wedding Ring is uh, two white white for an artifact, and when Wedding Ring enters the battlefield, if it was cast, target opponent creates a token that's a copy of it. Whenever an opponent who controls an artifact named Wedding Ring draws a card during their turn, you draw a card. And whenever an opponent who controls an artifact named Wedding Ring gains life during their turn, you gain that much life. So this is really about the card draw side of mm. things. Because your commander is drawing you cards when they attack, which turns into drawing you cards when they mm. attack. Uh, I, sorry, uh, your commander's drawing them cards when they attack. And, also and now it will be drawing you cards. Yeah. More cards for you when they attack. It right. breaks the parity. It makes it Which nice. I think is... The cool thing that I like about this is there's some downside to Wedding Ring, right? It's when you draw cards... On your turn. On your turn. They also draw cards yeah. on, on your turn. But your, all of your draw is so conditional, and it's so like when my opponent does two things or when my opponent does this, mm -hmm. then I draw. Most of the time, you're going to be drawing cards on your opponent's turn, not on your turn. Yeah. So now when your opponents attack another opponent and they draw your card and you draw your card, now you're drawing two cards, and you're, you're getting the benefit from the wedding ring without you giving away yeah. the value from the wedding ring. Which I think is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And also like... I think that there's going to need to be some politics in this deck. I, I agree. It's, you know, got that very, like, I compared it to Brina the Demagogue, which is a very political deck, mm -hmm. uh, the way it works. And this is kind of going to be the same thing. And Wedding Ring is the sort of card that can kind of make you an ally. I agree. Like, even if people, you know, kind of see through the, the, the fact that you gain something from Wedding Ring and you put it there, they're still going to be like... Well, I do draw cards on your turn. Yeah. Which kind of makes you on my side as far as Yeah, I don't want you here. to die. I could draw cards from you. Yeah, cards are great. Yeah, you make your, yourself important to somebody else in the game. I love Wedding Ring. I think I think that kind of thing is a ton of fun. Uh, that brings the total of this uh, upgrade to $44. Came in a little under the 50 A little there. under. It's good. You saved the people some of their money. Yeah, and I think we've added a lot that the deck really needs. Uh, a little bit more defense, a little bit more efficient goad, especially repeatable goad, so you're not yeah. relying on your commander attacking for that. Mm -hmm. Plus, um, just some good old-fashioned card draw to really bring up the floor here uh, in case, you know, your commander doesn't draw you all the cards that you think it's going to draw. Yep. All right, we've added 10 cards. That means we have to take 10 cards out. That was so dramatic. We did a bad job. I know you guys can't see over there, but it hit the wall. It made a sound. There was a whole thing. And that's a soundproof wall, so. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Yikes. We've added 10 cards. We have to take 10 cards out, which means we're doing uh, the tough work of commander players everywhere. Yeah. Some of these are easier to cut than others. Yeah, uh, the first one I thought was pretty easy to cut, which yeah. is Ancient Stone Idol. They love putting this in pre-cons. This is 10 mana, and it's Flash. It's a 12-12 with Flash. This spell costs one less to cast for each attacking creature. So I guess the idea is that, you know, someone attacks you with a ton of creatures, and you're like, bam, I'll block one of them with Ancient Stone Idol. <laughs> or you're attacking with a bunch of creatures, and you do it in. And it has Trample, and whenever Ancient Stone Idol dies, create a 6-12 colorless construct artifact creature token with Trample. I just don't think this is very good. I don't think so. A lot has to be going right for you this to come down when you need it, right? You yeah. you probably have goaded at this point, like you've cast a disrupt decorum and then you've cast this. Yeah. On, and like having the best card in your deck and also your pay payoff is a lot to ask of a 10 mana uh, card in your and deck. And like realistically, how many creatures are people going to be attacking with on maybe the four maybe form. and then this yeah. plus six you're that's like, like oh, not a sweet. great deal i mean it's it's huge it's fine it's it, huge. yeah it's good you have it you're not going to be unhappy that you have an ancient stone idol on board but that's not what i want yeah uh, uh the next uh, card cut yep. is anya merciless angel this is yeah. three red and a white for a legendary creature angel four four with flying anya merciless angel gets plus three plus three for each opponent whose life total is less than half their starting life total as long as an opponent's life total is less than half their life starting life total anya has indestructible yeah so um it's like a seven seven or a ten ten indestructible if the goading has really been working yeah and then it gives you a giant flyer to finish out the game i think is the idea with anya i kind of don't think it does much it's tough i 
I've never been able to get this card to work to have it feel good in the right moment. Like you don't really want to cast this as a five mana four four flying, and then because people look at it and they're they're like, you want to get my life total down? Yeah, and you're like, no, I don't. It's like your card says that. <laughs> and this card, like, it's very hard to be political when you have a ten ten flying indestructible on the board. It looks threatening, mm. and is sort of eventually, but. It also isn't, like, going to wipe out more than one player yeah. at any time. People will see it, and they'll realize you're the threat, and they'll have time to respond to it. I, yeah. I, I just don't love it. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I also, we've talked about this a little bit, but I, I think Indestructible isn't all it uh, used to be. Yeah. Uh, the next one is the backup commander for this deck. It is Feather Radiant Arbiter. It's red, white, white for a 4-3 flying lifelink, and that's sort of where the good stuff stops. This makes me so sad. I love um, Feather as a character because I was a big fan of the old like Ravnica books. And the and art stuff. is incredible. It's yeah, whenever you cast cool. a non-creature spell that targets only Feather, you may choose any number of other creatures that spell could target and pay two for each of those creatures. If you do for each of those creatures, copy that spell. So what Feather is doing in this deck, they, like I said, they have the vows, the auras that you put on stuff. So you would target Feather with a vow for like three mana usually, pay an extra two, and you could also put it on an opponent's creature. But that's five mana to put two auras on the board. It's a lot of mana. It's a lot, it's a of, lot of, of mana doing. to invest in in these auras, and mm -hmm. there's not that many in the deck. I could see a pretty cool deck that you built around Feather, but I, it's pretty tough. It requires a lot, a lot of mana. Even that, compared to the old Feather. It's not even close. Which is yeah. a bomb. Mm -hmm. Like I, I just think it's weak. It doesn't work in this deck. I agree. It might be weak overall as a card. Yep. Prove me wrong, please. I'm sure I'll see it and be like, oh, that was cool. Uh, this next one is Gideon's Sacrifice. This is uh, one white for an instant. It says, choose a creature or planeswalker you control. All damage that would be dealt this turn to you and permanents you control is dealt to the chosen permanent instead. Um, There's a Brash Taunter in the deck. This is to go with that. If you don't have the Brash Taunter, it just means that you, in order to fog, you kill a creature, yeah, which it's a funny is not trick. very good. They could also remove your creature, and now your fog doesn't work, and your creature's gone. I, I just yeah. think... Fogs that don't build your board state somehow or like mm -hmm. really give you a big advantage off of it are already a little suspect. Yeah. And this one does actually still wreck one of your creatures yeah. a lot of the time and is kind of cute, but I just don't think it gets you there. The deck also has two other fogs and a lot of ways to goad creatures. Yes. It, it really is not all that necessary. Uh, the next one is a new card is Havoc Eater. It mm. eats Havoc. Yum, yum. What? Uh, it's five mana red red three uh, so it's a sorry five red red for a seven mana three three flying elemental hmm uh, when it enters the battlefield for each opponent go up to one target creature that opponent controls put x plus one plus one counters on havoc eater where x is the total power of creatures goaded that way so you goad the three best creatures your opponents well the one best creature each opponent controls put a bunch of counters on this thing and then you have a giant flyer and it doesn't have haste yes Everyone will hate you for this card. They will be so <laughs> mad. If you goad three creatures and then produce a giant flyer, everyone will be like, okay, so this creature will go at you, but everything else is going at them, right? Yeah. It's, it, goading three creatures is not enough to yeah. assure that you're going to make it to your next turn. Mm. And I, yeah, I think about how I would react if someone else played this and... I would kill them. I would do everything in my power <laughs> to kill them. <laughs> it's like you think you're just going to win with that. Plus, after you do that, you you can only take out one player with it, right? Yeah. Like if they don't kill each other with the goaded creatures, then you're like, okay, I kill one of you. And the other two are still like, hey, I remember what you did. Yeah. And and, and I mean, honestly, how, how sure, yeah. maybe this is like an 11-11 or something like that. But it's not going to just end the game every time. Yeah. Uh, the next one coming out is Kazul, Tyrant of the Cliffs. It's a shame. I like this card a lot, yeah, but cool. he's just not as good as he used to be. It's whenever a creature an opponent controls attacks, if you're the defending player, create an ogre unless they pay three. So usually they'll attack you with a bunch of really big things or tramplers or flyers, and the ogres don't really do anything. Yeah, and, and the idea is you make an ogre for each creature and you block them with it or whatever, but mm. uh, it's, uh, it's just not quite enough. Next card is Orzov Advocist. 
This is a uh, two and a white uh, for a one four creature human advisor. And at the beginning of your upkeep, each player may put two one one counters on a creature they control. If a player does, creatures that players control can't attack you or planeswalkers you control until your next turn. Um, this card is slow and mm. tends to be a lot more low impact than you kind of expect. It also like doesn't actually stop those creatures from eventually attacking you. Right. I, I like the spider or the ant better because yeah. it does the counters on the end step. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing for me with this one is that they can't attack you. They don't have to attack your opponents. They're not goaded. Yeah. And then you have to wait. You cast it and you have to wait all the way to your upkeep for this to do anything. Yeah. Um, it's just it's just a little too slow. And the, the ant is much better because you can start putting counters on your commander. So agitator it's easier for her to attack. Yeah, agitator yeah. ant. I love agitator ant. Uh, um, this next card is incredible. I, I love this card. I, I, and I feel think it's quite bad in this deck. I, I feel bad cutting it because I also love it from like a game theory perspective. I'm it obsessed is, with this card. It is Prisoner's Dilemma and it does the Prisoner's Dilemma. That's it, literally what it does. It's three red red. Each opponent secretly chooses silence or snitch. Then the choices are revealed. If each opponent chose silence, Prisoner's Dilemma deals four damage to each of them. If each opponent chose snitch, Prisoner's Dilemma deals eight damage to each of them. Otherwise, Prisoner's Dilemma deals 12 damage to each opponent who chose silence. You can also flash it back for seven. This card is so funny. It's so brilliant because if everybody chooses silent silence, everybody takes four and you're like, ah, the card isn't that good. But if one person if decides one to snitch, person. Nothing bad happens to them, and everyone else gets wrecked. <laughs> and if everybody <laughs> snitches, everybody pretty much gets wrecked. Yeah, they don't like get quite as wrecked. a lot. And it, so it puts you in this really weird position where you're like, I mean, I'm probably gonna, just going to say snitch, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you, you go, well, I'm not going to snitch. I'm going to be silent, right? I'm snitch! Gonna snitch! We're going to snitch! I'm going to snitch! It's really cool. Um, I think this is better in a burn deck. This is better in like a dedicated aggro strategy. Yes. And this deck is trying to be a little sneakier. It's trying to put people like, it, it's trying to sit back. If you cast Prisoner's Dilemma, nobody thinks you're not the problem. Yeah. It, look, if you buy this deck, take Prisoner's Dilemma out and put it in a Perforos deck or something. Which and then is be like, awesome. Hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. Because their life totals are low. It's an even bigger dilemma. In this deck, it's just sort of weird. This, Yeah. Th this card, honestly, would be so fun to cast when one of your opponents has 12 or less yeah, life. exactly. And everyone else looks at them and goes... I'll snitch on them. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if you're at 12, you have to say snitch. Yeah, I think you... I think you have to, right? Yeah, because if you're silent and you don't snitch, yeah. you lose. Yeah. <laughs> I, I Yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. Uh, Josh it's, it's would probably fun. have opinions on this because he loves that game theory stuff too. Yeah. Uh, the next card that's getting cut is Stalking Leonin, which is a shame because it's um, one of the few interaction spells in the deck, yeah. but it's very, very conditional. It's two and a white for a cat archer. It's a 3-3. Three, three. When it enters the battlefield, secretly choose an opponent. Secret. Reveal the player you chose. Exile target creature that's attacking you if it's controlled by the chosen player. Activate only once. The thing is, this card wouldn't be broken if it didn't have the if it's controlled by the chosen player yeah. element of it. Uh, but it does. Yeah, I. The problem with this to me is your whole deck is dedicated to people not attacking you. Yeah, you're everything. You have tons of cards that say goat, don't attack me. A ghostly prison, don't attack me. This is interaction that only works if all of that has failed. Yeah, and you're like, I just don't want to play a card that says, okay, if none of the rest of my deck is working, this one works. Yeah, and it's also like sometimes people will be like, okay, well he's got the stalking lean in, but I'm gonna swing in and kill him with his attack. Yeah, and you're like, oh, oh, I might have named you in the stalking lean in. They go, well, prove it or lose we'll it. We'll find out. <laughs> and then you go, oh no, I didn't. I really thought that other person was going to be the threat when I yeah. cast this. It's also sort of a weird card that you have to have like paper or infinite tokens or something to to yeah. like show. Anyway, it's neat. Uh, it's it's weird. It's a cool card. I I think it's a little strange in a deck like this. And uh, the last cut is Winds of Wrath. Uh, yeah. We we have a trend of cutting uh, one board wipe each uh, from board, these decks. <laughs> board wipes that are like for the wrong deck. Yeah. <laughs> This one is three white white, and as sorcery, it says destroy all creatures that aren't enchanted. They can't be regenerated. Yeah, the auras in this deck are for your opponent's creatures. They're they're like vows that say this can't attack me, or they're impetuses that goads creatures. So you're just saving your opponent's creatures and destroying all of yours. So the joke is, oh, they've got to keep attacking each other. Nelly's dead, but fine. 
<laughs> like it's very weird. I just like wrath of God. It would be like at least everything dies. I think there's also like a decent number of board wipes. Yeah, in the there's deck like already. four board wipes. You in just it, I think. don't need that many board wipes. Uh, honestly, you're gonna want people to have stuff on board to attack each other. So for sure. All right, those are the cuts. From the blame game deck, it's definitely making some accusations. It's definitely playing yeah. the blame game. Um, before we go, I want to talk quickly about which precon uh, between these two you mm-hmm. like better. Like if you were if you walked into your game store and there was two on the shelf and you're like, I have forty five dollars in my pocket, I can buy one of those decks. Which would you buy and why? My answer, even yeah. though I think. More than some recent precons out mm-hmm. of the box, it needs work. Yeah. Would be blame game. Mm-hmm. Because I already, as I said, I already have a Brina deck, and yep. I think that the politics and the everyone fighting each other can be super fun. And I think there's a way to build this that's really unique and will make games like you don't play most of the time in Commander. Yeah. Um, and while I think Deep Clue C is seems good and like you could definitely build a, a solid value engine out of that. Uh, I I don't feel inspired by draw cards, make clues, you know? Yeah. Uh, The weird thing about Deep Clue C is is the Morshka is the commander, I think. Yeah. I, I she's very boring to me. It's it's like you make a clue on your upkeep, and if you draw two cards, put counters on her. She's no evasion. It, it's just not like that's not an interesting puzzle to solve. Yeah, that's but how I, I feel too. I do really like the backup commander of which that we deck, which is didn't Sophia. talk about, but we should mention. Yeah, right? Sophia Dogged Detective is uh, comes in. She makes a great Dane. She's a Scooby Doo commander. It's Scooby Doo. Is a Scooby Doo commander. <laughs> uh, I I think this commander is really really neat, and I do think that there's a lot more cards in the um, Deep Clue C precon that I'm like reprint specifically that I'm very excited about. The value seems great too. Um, yeah, and I, these are just like I, I Tesseret's a great card to have around. Adrix and Nev is a great card to have around. Benny Brax. Always need more Academy like, manufacturers. Oh, yeah, exactly. Those are all like a stack of cards. That's the stack I would buy. But if we're talking about the deck that I'm more interested in building, I agree. I think I think Blame Game has like some really neat stuff to it. I, I do think I would do a heavy rebuild on, yeah. on it's a little bit more permanent based. I would want it to be a little bit more like sneaky than it is right yeah. now. But um, it, it has a very cool aura to it, especially as a Boros deck. Yeah, and I think that's cool, especially mm. in Boros, which, you know, used to have a reputation as the worst color combo in yeah. Commander. Yeah, or as like, it's attack or it's equipment. Yeah, and, and has gotten a lot more interesting, mm-hmm. I think, but especially really benefits from having these cool different play patterns right. that create different board states and stuff like that. That still feel very Boros to me. Any deck that I can cast to come up and I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. uh, to the listeners, what do you think of these precons? Are there any cards that we missed uh, to add to the precons that you're like, of course, this card, you have plenty of space in the budget. Uh, any cards we suggested to take out or add that you disagree with? You're like, you know what? I wouldn't take Prisoner's Dilemma out for the world. I understand. I get you. Yeah. That card rules. Uh, <laughs> which precon <laughs> do you like better? And uh, what do you think of the new uh, episode format? Let us know if you like like having two of them together if you'd rather them be individual. The big pro for this for us is it means we can get all of the upgrades to you a little bit faster. It means we're not releasing them over the course of two weeks. They can come out much closer. Every time the first upgrade comes out, half the comments are, where's the upgrade guide for the other one? It's coming! It's It's coming! (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh! (laughs) We talked about a lot of cards in this episode. You can pick up all of those and the precons that we talked about at cardkingdom.com slash command. Card Kingdom has a huge selection of singles and sealed product. Uh, Murders at Carlov Manor is a really sweet set. There's a lot of cool flavor going on. I really love cases specifically. I like that there's a little mini game that you can be like, I did it. Check it out. Solve the case. Go to their website. Get the singles that you want. If you like the new dossier art frames, I like that I can always trust that Card Kingdom has a huge selection of the cards that I'm looking for, and I can get it in exactly the printing and exactly the condition that I'm looking for. Plus, they're going to ship it to me all in one package safely. I know exactly how it's going to look when it gets here. Uh, They're professionals. So even if something goes wrong in the mail, I know that I can get it covered. Again, support the show and pick up some sweet magic cards at cardkingdom.com slash command. 
And once those cards are in your hand, of course, you're going to need to protect them. Get some sleeves, get some deck boxes, play mats over from ultrapro.com slash command. UltraPro has an enormous selection of gaming accessories, whether you're a Magic player or a Pokemon player or a Yu-Gi-Oh player, you're probably a Magic player, but maybe you do other things. Yeah. I like UltraPro Dice for D&D. I use UltraPro Dice as well. Oh, yeah, good point. Uh, But I especially like that they have original Magic art on their products. So if I'm really excited about a set, like I am about this one i can get playmats with the art on it i can get my favorite commander i can find a binder that can store the cards from the set that matches the set it's uh lets you be organized and keep your cards safe which what more could you want as a magic player again ultrapro.com slash command uh before we go we're gonna say thank you to our amazing team here at the command zone who's responsible for making all these episodes Thank you to Damon Lentz, Eric Lem, Megan Yip, Garav Galati, Jamie Block, Arthur Mattercroft, Manson Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Sam Waldo, Evan Limberger, Katie Cole, Mitch Trafford, Josh Lee Quiet, Jimmy Wong, and of course to Jordan Pridgen for taking the time That's to me. upgrade these pre-cons. It's always fun having you on the show. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Always yeah. a great time. Play the blame game or or swim around in the deep clue sea with your Vidalkin. <laughs> thanks for listening. Uh, yeah, I'm shocked it's not a Merfolk. Yeah, I didn't know Vidalkins swim. That one swim? does. Swim? I thought Vidalkin. they were just walking around. Mm. Fish Vid- Is there another fish Vidalkin? That's the only one. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>